Hi, everyone. Welcome to June's version of the Reading Research Recap. For this month, I chose a paper on small group instructional time. So what are kindergarten teachers doing during this time? The too long didn't watch version is that there were some really positive things they were doing, but there's definitely room for improvement because there were some sort of harmful instructional activities that were occurring as well. I love this type of research because it kind of peels back the curtain on what's going on in schools and classrooms. And we can't really help until we first know what teachers are doing. And I also wanna say that I have written a few words about this debate between small groups and whole class um, phonics instruction. And I've written that in the written blog. So check that out if you are interested to hear a little bit of my thinking on that and what other researchers have weighed in on that. I didn't want to cover a paper on small groups without addressing that sort of topic that's been going around. Um, all right, let's jump right into some of the background and rationale for this study. Early intervention is absolutely critical for at-risk or struggling readers, but there's a lack of personnel, which means that classroom teachers have to pick up this burden, and it's unknown if they have the training required to be able to do this. Previous studies have examined which literacy domains, so phonics, fluency, etc., are covered during instructional time, but none have really looked at how skills are taught during that time. And for this paper, it was specifically teacher-led small group time in kindergarten. And there were 11 teachers across five different schools in two Texas school districts. And the researchers combined video recording, so observation, plus teacher interviews to answer this research question. Okay, so what were some of the results? Well, in terms of activity types, the most common activity was text reading at 36%, followed by phonics or decoding, followed by print concepts, and then comprehension instruction. Only one teacher engaged in writing instruction. Be sure to check out the written blog to see all the breakdowns of percentages. The most common instructional practice that the researchers observed was teacher modeling or teacher explanation. This was followed by teacher guided practice. They also noticed a lot of opportunities for students to respond as well as receive feedback and scaffolding and have time for independent practice. So all those four things I just mentioned are fantastic and really great instructional activities. Attention to the mouth shape as well as the use of sound boxes was relatively infrequent. Um, visual aids, flashcards, and gestures or movements were recorded more frequently, but still relatively low. During the text reading instructional time, they noticed that teachers, so over 70% of the time, teachers were using predictable text versus non-predictable text. And that over 90% of the time, teachers were encouraging students to memorize words versus sounding them out using their knowledge of decoding, which is a bit problematic, especially for at-risk or struggling readers. Like all studies, this one is not immune to limitations. So this was a small sample size. There were only 11 teachers. Video recording has certain limitations as well. And this study took place during the pandemic. So teacher stress was at an all time high. So was anxiety and depression. So we have to keep that in mind. And I really like that the researchers pointed that out. But the take home message from this study is that there were some really positive things happening like scaffolding, feedback, opportunities for students to respond and have time for independent practice during small groups. But there were some pretty um, alarming things as well. So the high use of predictable books during text reading instructional time combined in conjunction with the high um, use of promoting this memorization instead of sounding out words. So that's pretty problematic. And the researchers end, so that's the take home message. There's some good, there's some bad. And this isn't the sort of study though that we tell teachers you know, what to do. Um, this is kind of the study where it's like the researchers now need to come back and develop better PD or we need to think holistically, you know, not just teachers and researchers in their silos, but how do we get across what, um, what instructional practices are good for small groups? So more to come on that, but the researchers end the paper by saying that more PD or professional development could be really helpful for these teachers. And speaking of PD, I have a perfect study that pairs really nicely with this one. So when you go to those like fancy restaurants and the chef pairs like the meal with wine, um, 
I've got the perfect pairing for you guys in terms of research. So this study ends by saying that you need, the teachers need more PD or better PD to know what to do during small group time. Well, this study is a perfect pairing because it talks about which elements of professional development make one PD better than another. So which make, which elements make PD effective? The results of their research show that for PD to be effective, it should instill insight, motivate change, develop teacher techniques, and be embedded in practice. So these are things to keep in mind when evaluating certain PD opportunities for your upcoming school year. All right, that's all that I have for June, and I will see everybody in July.